Here. You can hear the TV. Oh, uh, you need to hit mute on your on your viewer. You need to hit mute. Okay. You have you have a mute button on your screen. Please hit the mute so that I can't hear anything. Nobody else can. All right. Somebody still has not hit their mute. See who it might be. There we go. I think I got it. Okay. Very good. We're going to have a, an interesting talk tonight, so we're going to get right at it. There's, I think you're going to learn a whole lot about the iliotibial band that you didn't know before. That's the purpose of any of these films that I do. Uh-oh, now what happened? Interesting. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Okay. So can everybody hear me now? Hello? Yes, can everybody can hear, hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Now we're going to get right to it. So we're going to go to the share screen. Um, and this is, as any of them are, uh, interactive. So we want everybody to interact. Uh oh, can everybody see this? Okay, we've got a chat box over here. Can everybody see the? Uh, Yes, yes, we can. Iliotibial band, okay. Yes. All right, very good. So we're going to kind of scoot this over a little bit so we can see the most of it. And any of um, any of these notes you can ask for, uh, all you got to do is press the button to ask for them, or you can uh, email me and I'll be giving out the email and my phone number, you know, if you want anything, I'm here to help you. The purpose of this is uh, for you to learn so that you can help uh, your, yourself, your loved ones, your patients more, okay? Um, okay, the iliotibial band and fascia lata is more important than you ever knew. Deep layer of the superficial fascia is intimately adherent to the fascia lata, a little below two parts ligament connected to the sheath of the femoral vessels on its under system, undersurface. So the connected to part here means that when there's tension on the fascia lata, it's going to affect the femoral vessels on the undersurface simply because when it's contracted, it's going to interfere with the flow of those femoral vessels. Okay. Now the superficial fascia uh, is perforated by the internal saphenous vein, which uh, of course goes to the lower leg. So it's going to affect circulation in the lower leg, numerous blood and lymphatic vessels. So that's going to affect the lymphatic vessels draining out of the leg and the ankles. So if you have somebody that has uh, any problems with retention of fluid in a given uh, individual leg or ankle, it may be because there's tension on the uh, fascia, the fascia lata, okay, in the iliotibial band. And this is known as the cribriform fascia, adhering closely to both superficial fascia and the fascia lata, being described by some anatomists as part of the fascia lata. 
pressure from enlarged lymphatic glands cause the fascia lata to atrophy, causing a femoral hernia. Okay, so here's a cause of femoral hernia that you may not have known about. How many of you knew that enlarged lymphatic bands can preclude a femoral hernia? Let's see that in the text box over here. How many of you knew that enlarged lymphatic glands can cause uh, atrophy in the fascia lata and cause a femoral hernia? Okay, we have a note by Dr. Bennett. Didn't Dr. Or Erica Dumalanta. Come on, we need a little bit of interaction here. Okay. Okay, Dr. Burke, no. Okay, good. This is generally not a known thing. So when somebody has enlarged lymphatic glands, you say, well, you know, are they hurting? Are they causing any other problems? That's kind of generally what we get when we're we're talking with a patient. And but actually it can lead to this femoral hernia. So we need to be concerned about it, regardless of whether there's any type of infection going on or if it's bothering them otherwise symptomatically because it can lead to that femoral hernia, okay? Deep fascia is named from its great extent, the fascia lata. So this is basically the deep fascia. It constitutes a uniform investment for the whole region of the limb, thicker in the upper outer part of the thigh where it receives expansion from the gluteus maximus muscle where the tensor fascia lata is inserted between its layers. Okay, so the tensor fascia lata is surrounded by the fascia lata. Okay, how many of you knew that the tensor fascia lata was actually surrounded by the fascia lata, the muscle itself, instead of just inserting into it, it's actually encased in it. How many of you knew that? I see that in the text box here. Okay, we have no. Dr. Bennett, yes, that's good. We're gonna see more things like this. Come on, let's have a little bit of feedback here. How many of you actually knew that the tensor fascia lata was encased by the fascia lata and not just inserted into it? Looked like that on drawings, okay. Most people just presume that it's like covered by it. Didn't know that it was actually the deeper part, okay. Okay, Diane, Dr. Terry, okay. It covers the adductor muscles in the upper inner part, okay. How many of you knew that the fascia lata actually extended to the adductor muscles of the thigh? How many of you knew that the, uh, that the fascia lata actually covers the adductor muscles of the thigh and can affect those as well? I see that in the text box over here. Yes, didn't know, didn't know, didn't know. So this is getting more expansive than we ever thought about. And it gets even better than that. The upper inner part becomes stronger around the knee, receiving expansions from the tendon of the biceps externally and the sartorius internally, quadriceps in the front. So, so we have an interaction between the fascia lata, the biceps femoris, the sartorius, and the quadriceps. So now we have the fascia lata, expansion of gluteus maximus, we have the adductors, the biceps femoris, the sartorius, the quadriceps. Okay, how many of you knew about all those interactions from the fascia lata? So we're getting really, really interesting in this. Let's see the text box over here. How many of you knew these things? Okay, Dr. Burke, no. Eric, no. Dr. Bennett, no. Okay, Eric, no, Diane, no. Okay, fascia lata is attached to the back of the sacrum and the coccyx above and behind. Probably most of you knew that, although some of you probably thought it was only uh, maybe to the iliac crest, okay? How many of you actually uh, knew that it's attached to, attached to the sacrum and the coccyx as well? 
is the LAF press. Let's see that in, in the text box over here. How many of you knew it's attached to the sacrum and the coccyx as well as the LAF crest? No, yes, yes. Nope, oblivious to it, not the coccyx. Okay, we're learning something here. Okay, it's externally the crest of the ilium in front to poop parts ligament and to the body of the os pubis hood. It even goes over to the pubic bone and attaches to poop parts ligament too. Internally to the descending ramus of the os pubis, tuberosity of the ischium, so it's attached to the ischium too. Okay, the lower border of the great sacroiliac ligament. Wow. So the sacroiliac ligament also. Okay, from the crest of the ilium, it passes down over the gluteus medius to the upper border of the gluteus maximus, where it splits into two layers going superficial and deep to it. So we, knew, we know now that it totally encases the tensor fascia lata. How many of you knew it totally encased the gluteus maximus also? I see that in the textbook, in the text box over here. Hey, Dr. Bennett, no. Terry, no. Dr. Burke, no. Come on, let's see some interaction here. I want to know that I'm actually teaching something beneficial to everybody that they didn't know. Okay, glad you know. That's good. Well, now you know it also. Now we're, we're looking to expand your knowledge to see these connections to see what you can actually affect by certain treatments. Okay. Externally, it unites with the tendon of, of the insertion of the gluteus maximus, where it arises from the front part of the crest of the ilium, corresponding with the origin of the tensor fascia lata. Passes down the outer side of the thigh, it's two layers, one superficial, one deep to the tensor, and at a slower end, unite together after uniting with the insertion of the muscle. The band continues downward is the iliotibial band, okay? So now we're in the iliotibial band, which I'm sure y'all knew about, and it's continuous with it. So the iliotibial band is going to directly affect, because it's a continuation of the entire gluteus maximus and the tensor fascia lata in the groin area, uh, because it totally encases them. And it's going to affect all the bones that we talked about, the ilium, the ischium, the pubis, and the sciatic, uh, sciatic ligament, OK? By the way, it says turn on YouTube. It is turned on. I turned it on before I started. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, below the fascia lata attaches to all prominent points around the knee joint. So it, it attaches to all the prominent points, the condyles of the femur, the tuber, tuberosities, the tibia, and the head of the fibula. On each side of the patella, it's strengthened by transverse fibers given off from the lower part of the vastus muscles attached to and supporting it, and the outer fiber is continuous with the iliotibial band. So um, the iliotibial band does not just go uh, and attach to the head of the fibula, but it also attaches basically to, the, to all the, the bones of the knee. How many of you knew that? Let's see that in the text box over here. How many of you knew that? Let's see that on the text box. Okay. No, no, no. Okay, so good. So this is going to free up all of those bones and therefore all the joints that they move with as you're affecting the tensor fascia or the fascia lata and the iliotibial band. Now, from the inner surface of the fascia lata are given off two intermuscular septa attached to the whole length of the linea aspera, belonged above and below the external one from the gluteus maximus insertion to the outer condyle, separating the vastus lateralis from the short head of the biceps, giving partial origin to these muscles. 
So the vastus lateralis and the head of the biceps, part of their origins are from the iliotibial band, which you probably knew about that because I teach that in my classes. And it can basically mimic a problem with the hamstrings or the quadriceps because of that, okay? The inner one separates the vastus medialis from the adductor and the pectineus. Besides these, numerous smaller septa separate the individual muscles, enclosing each in distinct sheets. So all of these individual muscles are enclosed in the sheets of the fascia lata. And it's not just, uh, not just the tensor fascia lata, not just the gluteus maximus, but all of these are encased by the iliotibial band, no less. How many of you knew that? I'll see that in the text box. How many of you knew that all of those muscles in the thigh that we just talked about are encased by the iliotibial band? Okay, good. Nobody knew that. A little below Pupar's ligament, it transmits the saphenous vein and other small vessels through the saphenous opening between the iliac and pubic portions. Okay, so here we're talking about the saphenous vein and the other small vessels coming back. So it's between the iliac and the pubic portion. So right in that area of the groin, we can let the tension off and actually help with the dilation of those veins and, you know, the complication of dilation of those veins, okay? And, you know, I want you to pay real close attention to this because we're gonna, we're gonna get the idea that we can really help not only uh, fluid, you know, back up in the lower extremities, but we can also help uh, the venous return in very certain areas, okay? So, you know, I want you to request this so you can carefully look through it and look at these things. And when somebody presents uh, with venous problems like dilated veins and spider veins, something in the lower extremities, you know exactly where to go because you can see right where they're being blocked. Okay. The iliac portion is the outer side of the saphenous opening attached to the crest of the ilium, the ASIS. The whole length of Pupar's ligament is far internally as the spine of the octubus pectineal line in conjunction with Gimbernaut's ligament. In the spine of the octubus, it reflects downward, outward, forming an arch margin. We saw a false form process or boundary, the superior cornu of the saphenous opening. The margin overlies the adherent to the anterior layer of the sheath of the femoral vessels. Sedge is attached to the cribriform fascia and below continuous with the pubic portion of the fascia lata. The pubic portion of the inner side of the saphenous opening is the lower margin continuous with the iliac portion, traced upward, covers the surface of the pectineus, the adductor longus, and the gracilis. Okay, so now we're looking at the gracilis being involved also, okay, which again can affect the knee, okay. Passing behind the sheath, the femoral vessels, which it is united, so here again, it's united to the femoral vessels, so when it goes into contracture, it's going to affect the flow through those vessels one way or another, which is continuous with the sheath of the psoas and the iliacus. So now we're affecting the psoas in the iliacus also from the iliotibial band, okay? How many of you know that you could affect the psoas in the iliacus, the gracilis, by treating the iliotibial band? That affects the posture and a whole lot of other stuff. How many of you knew that? Let's see that in the chat, bo chat box over here. Come on, let's have some interaction. How many of you knew these things? Didn't know, no. Okay, 
is attached above to the iliopectineal line where it becomes continuous with the iliac fascia, the internal saphenous, the aperture between them and joins the femoral vein. Okay, so you got the saphenous vein and the femoral vein, okay? The crural bands, branch of the genitourinary nerve, the first and second lumbar, passes beneath the parts ligament, enters the sheath of the femoral vessels, and pierces the anterior layer of the sheath of the vessels, okay? <clears throat> so you have the genitocrural nerve. So now uh, we're gonna be affecting the genitals, okay? Uh, in this upper part because it pierces the anterior layer, layer the sheath of vessels, becomes superficial by piercing the fascia lattice, applying the skin of the anterior thigh as far midwise, midway between the pelvis and the knee. So here we're affecting the skin. So we can have the burning of the skin in this area. We can have numbness, we can have pain in the skin area here because it pierces that, okay? External cutaneous nerve, the second and third lumbar, passes under two parts of the anterior branch, which descends in the aponeurotic canal, formed in the fascial lattice, becomes superficial about four inches below two parts, divides in the branches, distributes to the integument or covering along the anterior and outer part of the thigh as far down as the knee, occasionally communicating with a branch of the long saphenous nerve in front of the knee. Okay, so now we're involving the long saph saphenous nerve also. And by the way, these are going to reciprocally, when there's a problem here, affect the first and second lumbar nerve and the second and third lumbar nerve. So when we're having these issues here, it can go up and affect these neurological areas causing back pain and spasm and et cetera, et cetera. So now you're looking at very specific things that can cause back pain from very specific areas in the thigh, okay, in the hip area. The posterior branches, a branch pierces the fascia lata, subdivides into branches, pass backward, backwards across the outer and posterior surface, uh, of the which supplying the integument from the crest of the ilium as far as the middle of the thigh. So here's the covering again, causing any type of symptoms in there. Communicating branch of the anterior, branch of the in, internal cutaneous and saphenous nerve or the obturator nerve, the lower border of the adductor longus occasionally emerges from beneath the sartorius to the inner side of the knee where it pierces the fascia lata, communicating with the long saphenous nerve distributed to the integument or the covering of the inner side of the leg as low down as its middle. So from the inner side of the knee, pierces the fascia lata and then affects the inner side of the leg there, okay? So right where it pierces that, it affects everything below it. The anterior branch, the internal cutaneous branch of the anterior division, the anterior crural nerve runs downwards on the sartorius and perforates the fascia lata at the lower third of the thigh, divides into two branches, supplying the integument as low down as the inner side of the knee, the outer patella, communicating with the nervous cutaneous patella, a branch of the internal saphenous nerve. So everywhere where this perforates the fascia lata, uh, those very specific spots, it affects these particular structures, the veins, the nerves, the arteries and everything uh, that are uh, distal to them and uh, the lymphatics, everything distal to them as well because it's blocking the drainage out of them, just the same as the, uh, as the veins. So the nervous, uh, the outer side of patella communicating with the nervous cutaneous patella branch of the internal saphenous nerve. The posterior internal branch descends along the inner border of the sartorius to the knee and pierces the fascia lata, communicates with the long saphenous nerve. There we go again, another area where it pierces it. 
gives off several cutaneous branches, then passes down the inner part of the leg to the covering of the leg. This nerve with the lower border of the adductor longus unites with the long saphenous and obturator nerves. The internal cutaneous nerve pierces the fascia lata to supply the integument or the covering of the inner side of the thigh accompanying the saphenous vein. Now there's the saphenous vein and we're looking at dilated veins in the leg because of that. One passes through the saphenous opening, second pierces about the middle of the thigh and the third pierces the fascia at its lower end. So here we have a piercing at three different levels that can cause problems. When you become familiar with these, then you can say, oh, right here where it pierces is where I need to let it up because it's affecting this integument or covering, this vein, uh, this ligament, this artery, this nerve. The longer internal saphenous nerve of the anterior curl at the inner part of the knee beneath the sartorius pierces the fascia lata opposite the interval between the tendons, sartorius, and gracilis descending to the inner ankle and foot as large as far as the great toe. So here we're having something affect the great toe from a distance, okay? You got somebody with toe issues. Had you ever considered working on the iliotibial band to affect pain in the great toe? Let's see in the chat box, how many of you have considered that before? You may have considered everything that I've said up to this point, but how many of you considered freeing up the iliotibial band for big toe pains and conditions? No, 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 no. That's good. We're learning something there. And communicating with the internal branch of the musculocutaneous nerve. Okay. So where it pierces through there musculocutaneous nerve. The long saphenous nerve at the inner side of the knee pierces the sartorius and the fascia lata and is distributed to the integument of the front of the patella. So now we're talking about uh, the front of the patella. People have pain and different symptoms on the front of the patella. We're looking at the inner side of the knee where it pierces sartorius and the fascia lata, okay? Small sciatic nerve in the lower part of the popliteal region pierces the fascia and accompanies the external saphenous vein to about the middle of the leg communicating with the external saphenous nerve. Okay, so here we're giving you a roadmap of all the nerves, all the fascia that emanate through and pierce through very certain areas that affect very certain structures, okay? And you may want to organize it different from what I have here so you can map it out better for yourself. And that's good. When you, uh, when you ask for a copy of this, you can splice it and put it in whatever form you want to. A perineal cutaneous nerve pierces the fascia lata below the tuber ischii, so below the ischium, to be distributed to the integument or covering of the scrotum in the male. Okay, so now we're affecting the scrotum the superficial perineal and inferior hemorrhoidal nerve. So now we're causing hemorrhoids from the fascia lata, from the iliotibial band. How many of you knew that you could affect from the iliotibial band, the scrotum in the male, the labium in the female, and hemorrhoidal nerves? How many of you knew that? No, no, no. Okay, very few know that, and that's good. So we're learning something different here. The center of gravity of the whole body lies near the body of the second sacral vertebra. How many of you knew that? How many of you knew that the center of gravity of the whole body lies near the body of the second sacral vertebra? I know there's a guy out there that's teaching the center of gravity is the third lumbar vertebra. I've had people tell it to me. I've had to pull it out of uh, anatomy books and show them that's not correct. So I don't know where he's getting his information. However, we are going to show you something about the third lumbar vertebra. 
perpendicular drop from this point to the ground falls behind the axis, the movement of the hip, the weight of the body thus tends to cause the pelvis to roll backwards at the hip. This tendency is resisted by the disposition of the ligaments, which especially the iliofemoral ligament are taut during standing and take most of the strain. The iliopsoas, the chief flexor of the hip joint, is apparently not called upon when standing at ease. So we're taking the stress off of the muscles, and we're going to see more of that, and putting it basically directly on the ligaments. At the knee, the deep fascia is continuous with that of the leg and attached to the condyles of the tibia, the head of the fibula, the patella, and therefore can affect all the structures passing to or from the knee downward. Of course, we saw that it was um, affecting the condyles of the femur also. Now, this is directly out of Guyton's fifth edition. Man walks in an upright position, and his limbs have become straightened to the point Almost no muscular strength is required to maintain the weight of the body against gravity. For instance, the direct line between the center and mass of the body and the direction of the gravity pulls slightly behind the axes of the hip joints, so the gravity tends to extend the hips and so that the ligaments of the hip joints, rather than the muscles, support the body against gravity. So here we're looking at this continuum of the iliotibial band and the fascia lata that keeps you upright and takes the stress off of the muscles to keep you in an upright position, okay? How many of you knew that the iliotibial band and the fascia lata was basically, to the greatest extent, uh, responsible for taking all the stress off of the muscles of the entire body in the standing position. Good. That keeps it in the hip socket. Now, in the erect position, a per perpendicular line through the center of gravity of the trunk falls behind the line joining the, set of the centers of the femoral heads. The mechanical requirements at the hip joint are that it must be capable not merely of supporting the entire weight of the body as in standing on one leg, but of stable transference of the weight, even during movement of the trunk upon the femur. So one of the ways you can tell if you have intact fascia and iliotibial band is to have somebody stand on one leg. If they can't do it, then you got all these muscles that are being affected and uh, the fascia, uh, the fascia lata and the iliotibial band are not functioning properly, okay? Because as you see, it's covering and encasing all those muscles that are involved, include, including the iliopsoas area, okay? And the gluteus maximus, the adductors, uh, the femoral muscles, the hamstrings, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then you have the transference of weight, even doing, during the movement of the track uh, trunk on the femur, such as occurs with rapid alternation at the two hip joints during walking and running. The joint must therefore possess great strength and stability, even at the expense of limitation of range and movement. The center of gravity of the whole body lies near the body of the second sexual vertebra. A perpendicular drop from this point to the ground falls behind the axial movement of the hip. A plumb line drop from the center of the body, here's the third lumbar vertebra should intersect with the front third of the sacral base, okay? How many of you knew that when you take a lateral lumbar to see if, if you have a curve in that lumbar, and you drop a plumb line down, you put an X through the middle of the body of the third, that should drop in the middle of the third, uh, front third of the sacral base, and you're looking at pretty, pretty good balance there. How many of you knew that? Okay, did not know, okay. Come on, let's see some interaction here. How many of you knew that? No? When you're taking that lateral lumbar, we're showing you ways that you can uh, look at it and show it to the patient, drop that line down and say, hey, you're in balance. Now, how, how about from the cervical area? One line drop from the center of the second cervical should intersect the center of the seventh cervical vertebra. So if you got a curve, in the neck, 
Uh, Cobb's angle is uh, a bit different from that, okay? Cobb's angle is a bit different. So how many of you knew that if you made an X in the second cervical and an X in the seventh cervical, you drop a plumb line down through the middle of that X, the middle of those bodies, they have to directly intersect each other uh, for a curve. Oh, we have one yes in there. We have some no's. And this is how you can point out to a patient, hey, your curve isn't right, and this is causing problems, okay? So this is gonna, in any problems in any of those areas is gonna affect proprioception everywhere in the body, basically, because you're throwing the balance off. Okay, now, what about uh, everything from the head down. Well, a plumb line dropped from the external auditory meatus should bisect the humerus head, the femoral head, and fall just in front of the ankle. How many of you knew that? If you're looking at the whole body from a plumb line. Some of you have plumb lines in your office. How many of you knew that plumb line drop should intersect the external auditory meatus the humerus head, the femoral head, and fall just in front of the ankle. Good, we got a lot of yeses on that, okay. Now, let's talk about uh, releasing some tension on the fascia lata neurologically. Well, Basso's reflex, which we teach this in part one, contraction of the tensor muscle of the fascia lata on tickling the sole, okay. So I took that and I said, okay, I ought to be able to take a prod and I kind of I look at these things and I say, how do these MDs come up with this stuff? Because uh, the soul's reflex is in Dorland's medical dictionary. I'm thinking, he's, he's got his wife, he's got his kid, they have groin pain, he's tickling their soul, and all of a sudden the groin pain goes away. Okay. And I'm picturing this in my mind. I'm saying, okay, how can I duplicate this without, let's say, tickling them? So I'm thinking, take the small tip prod and just go over and over and over the ipsilateral sole of the foot to release the tension of the fascia lata and thus release the groin pain. So I've done this on people hundreds and hundreds of times. And I have some people, uh, their groin pain is when they lay on their back, some when they're sitting, some when they're sitting with the leg crossed at the ankles uh, or an ankle over the knee, or they may be standing standing straight up with the leg in front, with the leg behind. And if they're in the standing position, I just have them, or the sitting position even, I have them roll their foot outward. I take that small tip prod and I just go over and over the sole of the foot. And I say, okay, tell me when you feel uh, the muscle relaxing in your groin and tell me when the pain is gone. And this works really well. Usually it just takes maybe 10 or 20 seconds and that's about it. Okay, how many of you knew you could do that with that small tip prod? to get rid of groin pain. Let's see this answer in the uh, chat box over here. How many of you knew you could do that? I just took this reflex and said, hey, let's, let's see how we can use that. That's good. So now you got one way to take rid, uh, get rid of a certain type of groin pain. Now we have another way, scrape and or adjust the axillary area of the external abdominal obliques which attaches to the fifth or 10th rib in the axillary area. So basically you take and you scrape that area and I tell people to use a carabiner, okay? Uh, and you may have to adjust those ribs one against the other because maybe they landed on their side and injured the area, you got a problem with the intercostal uh, ligaments, the intercostal muscles there. So you may have to do that as well. But guess what? That releases uh, the external abdominal oblique, which in, interacts with the internal abdominal oblique on the opposite side, okay, which attaches to two parts ligament. So before you do that, now you're palpating directly the two parts ligament. And you release the external abdominal oblique on the contralateral side and it releases uh, the ipsilateral side uh, a groin pain, which is centered around poop parts ligament, okay? How many of you knew you could use those tactics to re directly release poop parts ligament pain and everything associated with it? Let's see that in the chat box over here. That's all in uh, part two. Uh, 
for that particular maneuver, okay, and part three with the adjusting of it, okay. That's good. We're all learning something here. Tapping poo parts for any condition because of how it affects the fascial lata and the iliotibial band and the proprioception, therefore, of the whole body can affect anything in the body. Okay. So we teach that in part one. And Barlow's and Ortolani's maneuvers will affect sciatica. Now, uh, we're going to show you something on Barlow's and Ortolani's in a movement. Scraping at the attachment of the superior fibular head for the thoracic scoliosis symptoms. Okay. And so we're going to show you that. And I saw that out of this picture that we're going to show you out of Turex orthopedics, that uh, tension in the uh, iliotibial band can cause a scoliosis simply because of where it attaches. And I tried it on uh, lumbar scoliosis, didn't seem to work. It had a magnific magnificent effect on uh, the thoracic scoliosis. Okay, so we're going to get in there and show you that here in a minute. So that's the body of this. We're going to go back and we're going to pull up uh, a couple of different things here. <coughs> Okay, so here is Turex Orthopedics, right here, volume one, page 530, it's fourth edition, 530, <coughs> pardon me. And I saw this when I was reading through Turex. Here we have iliotibial band contracture, okay? And I saw that, okay, it pulls down on the ilium. And that in turn affects the quadratus lumborum and the transverse abdominis. Quadratus lumborum attaches to the 12th rib and the tips of the spinous processes of all the lumbar vertebra. Okay, so that's pulling down on those. And it caused a curvature here. Well, I found that the, most of the stress from that spine wise is up here in the thorax. So I said, okay, how can I release that? And I tried just the general releases of the iliotibial band didn't seem to work too well. So I just used the carabiner and I scraped right here at the upper border of the fibular head. And that seemed to do the trick. And you have to do that in the standing position. And I go over this in the uh, part two of the T-TAPS uh, seminars, and it's in part two of the film. It's just one of the things that you learn. So you say that somebody with uh, thoracic pain, they have a scoliosis, it's on one side. Say, okay, which side is it? They stand there, and while they're standing, you scrape right there, just, just above and at the superior border of the fibular head. They'll say, oh, that hurts. That hurt anybody. You go to the other side, you say, does that hurt? They say, well, no. I said, well, okay, just this side. And then you stretch it. And we show you a specific stretch, which isn't normally uh, what you look at. It's a kind of variation of overs is what we show, which is the best stretch. And you stretch it for about 20 seconds. You go back and you get the residual pain right there. Then you say, okay, how's that tension and pain in the thoracic area? And they go, oh my gosh, it's gone. Okay, so there's a way to release this and release the pain and tension in the uh, thoracic area for scoliosis. How many of you knew you could release thoracic pain of scoliosis by basically scraping uh, the upper part of the fibular head where the iliotibial band attaches? How many of you knew that? Let's see over here in the, okay, those that are taking the class know that, of course, and watch the film. Good. You guys need to take part two so you can learn stuff like this or get the film. Okay. Very good. Eric and uh, Diane learned that part two. That's great. Okay. Now we're going to go to a different one. Okay, so here is 
Barlow's and Or Orlandi's maneuver. And I basically put this up um, in my office on the wall. Uh, and I, I, I tell them what I'm doing here, okay? Uh, Barlow's maneuver, uh, basically, uh, you add up, you, you bend the knee and you take it towards the chest and you circle around midline. And that's to basically slightly dislocate the hip socket. Okay. Hip can be popped out, popped out of the socket with this maneuver. So you're going to slightly dislocate it first. In order to land these is to reset the dislocation of the hip. Now I've tried it in both both ways and I found that it usually works better to slightly dislocate it first and then relocate it with Orlandi's maneuver. And I have this and I show it to patients on the wall, usually a visitor or two after that, they're up there looking at that because they really want to know what you're doing, okay? And this basically can help a lot of sciatic cases and uh, affect basically about anything in the body uh, by just maneuvering uh, the hip socket itself and thus affecting all that fascia and and the uh, proprioceptors all through the body. How many of you knew you could use Barlow's and Orlandi's to affect basically almost any condition in the body? How many of you knew that? I see that in the chat box over here. So dislocating and relocating the hip. Okay. Now we teach that we teach that and uh, part one and part uh, two and part three. I think it's so important to learn these particular moves. Okay. That's good. We're learning something here. Okay. Now we're gonna we're gonna go on to some other stuff. Uh, how many of you have any questions whatsoever with anything we've covered so far? That's the main body of the seminar here. How many of you have any questions whatsoever over anything that we covered? I'm going to give you my uh, email, drbbrk at hotmail.com, and my phone number if you want to call 469-995-9907. And feel free to call me anytime. If I can't get right with you, it's not because I'm avoiding you. I, I just have something else. I'm working on a patient or doing something else. I can't get it to you right then. I want you to use this to help your patients. And that's what I'm giving these for because I want to disseminate this knowledge. Okay. So don't hesitate to call me or email me about it. Okay. Or you can even text me, you know, on that text number also. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you, you know, I had been working on part four film. Part four film is entirely out now. So parts one, two, three, and four are entirely out. And so we'll talk about those in a, in a few minutes as to what they constitute. Now, the next thing is evidence-based medicine and best practices, okay? We hear that uh, we're judged by this. Uh, but a lot of times we don't actually know what it is. You know, we're told, hey, we're being judged by this by our boards, but we don't even know what it is. And funny thing is, is uh, when I first went to uh, be approved by um, be approved by PACE, uh, I put that on my flyers and the guy said I was on the board of the ACA and I don't even know what it is because I claim on there that it fulfills the ACA's uh, best practices and okay, best practices and uh, evidence-based medicine. He said, I don't even know what it was, you know, what it is. And I was on their boards and so I just went and I copied it off. This is taken directly off of their website, the ACA website. Basically what it is, is uh, you're taking the best 
things that are proven in literature and what you know from your experience in your practice. That's what this is about, okay? You're saying, okay, uh, I'm gonna use those particular things and, and we're going to uh, get results from them. So this is a combination of the two. And you can get these, all you gotta do is ask for them. Uh, I think you can put punch a button there and it'll be sent to you. And so that's what we're looking at on these particular things, okay? What am I gonna get out of this particular? Oh, I gotta pull this out, okay, there we go. So you can request that and I suggest that you get it so that uh, you know exactly what those things are. Okay, now we have um, the videos. What are the videos about? We'll talk about the videos just a little bit. So we have one, two, three, and four. And these are basically the seminars that I give, but they are not films of the seminars themselves. So you don't have to sit and watch people treating each other. And by the way, we're gonna put these in CE form and hopefully get them up on most of the sites that allow uh, video uh, online CEs. That's kind of the next thing that we're looking to do here, okay? And if you, uh, if you order these uh, tonight, uh, you can get them for $250. That's pre-publication price after tonight, though it goes up to the post-publication price $500. Because most of you probably didn't even know they were there, uh, we're going to extend this to you. Okay, uh, you can even email me and say, "Well, I want to order them, but I can't do it right now." That's fine. Just email me and let me know. Uh, but we got to know about that. You can also order them online, etapcenter.com, under Seminars Professional. Go to the seminar you want, type in film, your phone number, click the down arrow by 395, and choose 250. You can order them online, or you can just call me. 469-995-9907, which is on uh, the chat box there. What are they about? Film one is the use of myotatic reflexes to resolve pain and biomechanics of chronic neuromusculoskeletal problems. Seminar regarding patient treatment by myotatic withdrawal, cross extensor reflexes, reflex to posture, locomotion, reciprocal inhibition. To learn things such as getting somebody off a cane or a walker in one or two visits or standing up out of a wheelchair in just a few visits if it's due to weakness instead of paralysis. I've done this hundreds of times in front of people, you know, in seminars. I, I've had people bring people in in wheelchairs saying, well, I'm not here uh, because of paralysis, but it's because of weakness. And I work on them and we get them to stand up a little bit of age. I had one guy stand up, hadn't been able to stand up for uh, seven years, and his chiropractor had been his chiropractor for 35 years, brought him in. This was in, uh, this was in Omaha, brought him in, and chiropractor was amazed, his wife was amazed, he was always amazed. And I said, okay, now your chiropractor knows how to do this. You ought to be walking without help in, you know, maybe three to six months or so, uh, because you got to really strengthen it up, but we activate those muscles. Immediately restore significant range of motion. Understand how reciprocal innervation can immediately help restore function in distant parts of the body. Correct foot drop in the majority of cases. Foot drop, okay? We show you how to do that. And we show you why it works. Cogwheel rigidity of arm and leg, most stroke victims, and uh, not only stroke victims, but cerebral palsy victims, improve hearing and tinnitus in most cases, okay? You get like an immediate response in most cases. You think you've all seen it all, think again. These are quite amazing things. In most cases, quickly and significantly reduce or eliminate following symptoms, and it does fulfill the ACA evidence-based medicine best practice as official policy. Fibromyalgia, sciatic, I, I just, I have a, a doc in Florida I'm mentoring, he says he's using it on all these old people down there and very quickly eliminating, eliminating their fibromyalgia, usually in just seconds. 
And he's going, you know, it, it is totally amazing. Never seen anything work like it. Sciatica. Now, all this is verified by standard orthopedic and neurologic tests. It's not just saying stuff that we can do. Standard orthopedic and neurologic tests verify it. Okay. You do a before and after on the patient, and they can see it and feel it that way. Uh, herniated or bulging disc. Unoperated rotator cuff, frozen shoulder, regional pain syndrome, formerly known as RSD, burning tongue and mouth, burning pain in the lower extremities, general, genitals, upper body, female cyclical menstrual pain, vaginal prolapse, numb hands and feet, drop transverse cuboid arches, hyper and polyhidrosis, cogwheel rigidity, ALS, Guillain-Barre symptoms, seizures, which are how to stop a seizure in 15 seconds and more than that, we'll show you how to keep seizures from coming back. Cranial nerve symptoms, such as nystagmus, strabismus, uh, Weber's sign, hearing loss of different frequencies, tinnitus, there's foot drop again, the tunnel syndromes, colder burning hands or feet, Renaud's. Yeah, we, we got rid of an MD's Renaud syndrome in Kansas City. She'd had it for years did something on her nose, and in 10 minutes, she said, it was the depth of winter when it was the worst. She said, I can't believe it. Uh, my hands aren't cold anymore. They're not numb. And she wanted to come to the second seminar. She was from New Mexico, and she said, you got to give me three months notice. And two and a half years later, I, I usually set these, you know, months to six weeks out. And I said, okay, I finally got this set three months out just so you could attend. And she said, great, yeah, I'll, I'll go to it. In Missouri, no problem, I'll fly in. I said, how's your Renaud? And she said, uh, what are you talking about? Your, your Renaud syndrome. I treated you at last seminar. She said, I don't know what, I, what you're talking about. Two weeks later, she calls me back. She says, I totally forgot I had it. I had it for decades. I haven't had any symptoms since you treated me two and a half years ago. That's how good this is. Loss of vibration sense in the in the feet and the toes, uh, dizziness, vertigo, positive pinwheel test, bladder leakage. So we got incontinence there and uh, uh, wetting the bed, for example, MS and Parkinson's symptoms. I, I tell stories about those. You're going to be amazed. This is not reflexology, AK, CRT, PNT, TBM, trans restriction massage, spinal reflex therapy, contact reflex analysis, none of it. This is uh, totally something you've never seen or heard of before. It's based on known tenets of acupuncture, trigger point therapy, reflexes, and neurology found in laws and tenets in Dorland's Illustrated Medical Dictionary. And we show you this right out of the textbook. Chooses neurophysiology, guidance textbook, medical physiology, and others as taught in CCE accredited chiropractic colleges. So I got this out of reading those and extrapolating on those. To get these amazing results. Eric says best investment next to going to the live seminars. He's got all of those. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Treatment effects are verifiable by standard orthopedic neurologic exam. I am published in JMPT, Chiropractic Economics on techniques being taught, and I'm a former adjunct faculty member, postgraduate division of the Texas Chiropractic College. Now, this basically takes care of strict reflexes and light -like scar tissue in the skin, in the dermis. So TTAPS part two deals with dense scar tissue outside of the joints. Now the first part is actually a continuation of part one. We just didn't have enough time to cover it. So the first thing we teach is we show you how to Test over 200 muscles easily in less than 10 minutes. Immediately strengthen all the weak ones. The only exception being extreme atrophy takes longer, and that's usually in a couple of foot muscles by lightly touching a single muscle, just like this. So instead of having to go from muscle to muscle, as in applied kinesiology, and I've taught this, uh, by the way, to seven diplomation of kinesiology. They just can't believe it. They never see anything like it. Lightly touch one muscle, all the muscles in the body come strong without having to strengthen each individual one. 
Again, the only exception being if you got extreme atrophy and want it just takes a little bit longer to go. Second thing we teach you is how to lightly but firmly palpate everywhere in the body, lightly touch one spot, bang, you go over the whole body and there's no pain. The only exception being if you have extreme inflammation, the pain will normally drop in half and it just takes a little while longer to settle down. So now you don't have to go from trigger point to trigger point through the whole body, you take care of them all at once, okay? Quite amazing stuff. Now we show you how to simply free up scar tissue between other muscles normally in one treatment. And we're gonna talk about that in a bit here. So chronic athletic injuries, hamstring, ankle, wrist, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, rotator cuff, knee, turf toe, shin splints, chondromalacia, patella, weak ankles, tricked knees, plantar fasciitis, neuralgia, parasitic, bronchitis, asthma, gagging, esophageal spasm, reflux esophagitis, TMJ syndrome, migraine headaches, chronic whiplash, chronic knee, ankle, shoulder elbow, wrist pain, tendonitis, bursitis, adhesive capsulitis, frozen shoulder, Eupatrans contracture, trigger finger, Oshkosh slaughters, chronic fever and sore throat, scar tissue and acupuncture methods, old fractures, chronic pain, bone sclerotome pain, fibromyalgia, burning pain, resistant sciatica, spondylolisthesis. Okay, spondylolisthesis and bulging discs in the neck and low back. Uh, we'll show you. Uh, the true etiology that's causing the bulging, protruding, herniated disc, degenerated disc, and spondylolisthesis, and how to, within seconds, relieve the pressure on it so that the person's not having it. Quite eye opening, okay? Necessity of using a cane or walker, rotator cuff, frozen shoulder, foot drop, hearing loss of different frequencies, all the tunnel syndromes small joint fibrous ankylosis, chronic shingles pain, arthritic toes and fingers, unadhere organs from each other, stimulate circulation lymphatic flow, diaphragmatic and accessory breathing muscle function. We teach endonasal technique, four different ways to approach endonasal, including balloon nasoplasty, eustachian tube techniques for chronic sinusitis, migraines, true eustachian tube deafness, Meniere's syndrome, so between uh, part one and part two, we show you how to deal with true nerve deafness and eustachian tube deafness. And we show you how to differentiate the two. Female cyclic, cyclical menstrual pain, and I would add to that uh, perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms. We get into that also. Vaginal prolapse, dizziness and vertigo, Dropped longitudinal transverse cuboid arches, unexplained chest pain, MS Parkinson's, ALS, gain bar A symptoms, ankylosing spondylitis symptoms, seizures, and a lot more. And basically, basically, you know, it's the same stuff here. Now, this is not transverse friction massage, AK, ART, or grasping. Okay. Now, a ART, right in the seminar, lady says, Takes four to six visits to free up a muscle. Grass in six to ten. Transverse friction massage, right? Syriac manual says it takes ten to twenty visits. We show you with a lot less effort, a lot less effort on your part, pain to the patient, literally in seconds, normally, very few exceptions that free it in one visit. So you're coming out, you're a lot less exhausted. The patient doesn't have the pain and bruising that you do with these other techniques, and you can treat more in less time. Okay, you get scads of referrals by doing all these sorts of things. Now, so the first seminar takes care of uh, reflexes alone, maybe a little bit of scar tissue uh, in the skin. The second one, dense scar tissue outside the joints, so that leaves dense scar tissue inside the joints which is film three, seminar three. So adjusting manipulation, mobilization of extremities, cranials, and vertebra, okay? Now to give you an idea of my experience, I've seen over 40,000 patients from all 50 states and 97 countries. I have people coming in from all over 
to get treatments. And I've treated over 3,000 upper level athletes, over 800 of which were professional, 12 professional athletic teams. I was the first chiropractor invited to treat athletes at the NFL run for daylight fast man competition. Okay, that's some of the background. Now, the first thing we teach in this seminar is how to find a single segment while the patient's standing. You palpate. Uh, the tense muscles of the paraspinals and the pain to so get them uh, to acknowledge the pain. I stand up chiropractors right in the class to do this right at the start. We show you how to find a single segment, lightly tap it like this, wait about 10 seconds, then go back and all the tension in the par paraspinals and the pain in the paraspinals is gone, just like that. Just by a light tapping, just like that. Okay. That's to get rid of the compensatory subluxations so that you're now left with the primary subluxations. One of the things chiropractors have trouble with is figuring out how to differentiate the compensatory subluxations from the primary ones. We show you how to do that. So we show you how to get most athletes back on the field in days, even if, even if off for months in most cases. So we show you how to treat ribs and costal cartilages, sulfur and tennis elbow, chondral malignation patella, bunions, dementias. Wow, we show you how to treat dementias from the knee. Right after you do it, which takes seconds, the person's facial flush and their cognition starts to change immediately. We've had people who couldn't remember uh, their children, their spouse's names, or uh, grandkids' names immediately start calling them by their names right after we do this. And, uh, and you know, it's amazing when you see it happen. We'll show you why that's so. High arches, flat feet, drop transverse cuboid arches, reliably relieve reflux esophagitis, esophageal spasm, upper GI conditions, and hiatal hernia. This is not by adjusting the stomach down, it's by adjusting a segment. It's very predictable. And we show you why it's so. We show you the mechanical reason why that occurs. Acromial and sternoclavicular joints, chondritis, osteochondritis, chondritis, hallux rigidus, hammer and claw toes, bow legs, knock knees. Yeah, we can show you how to correct bow legs and knock knees, all these other things. Flat feet, high arches, and it's pretty quick in most cases. Frozen shoulder adhesive capsulitis, rotator cuff. Uh, all the tunnel syndromes. Now, in the cranial techniques, uh, I've gotten autistic children speaking sentences after only single words or squeaking or not talking at all. Significant demeanor changes. These children walk around and they're angry all the time. For example, when I was in uh, California, a chiropractor said, can I bring in a lady? She has a 20, 21-year-old autistic child. I said, yeah. So they come in and he's pacing, he's angry. And I said, okay. And I, I went back and I met him and I asked him to come up front. I asked him to sit down and I asked him, you know, would you let me treat him? And he nodded yes. And they're amazed because he wouldn't let anybody touch him. And there's a certain way for demeanor to allow that to happen. And the whole treatment setup for the treatment takes about three minutes. To show you how to adjust all the cranials like that, okay? And immediately afterwards, he got up, he went in the back, and he sat down quietly. So he didn't have this angry pacing. I get a call from his chiropractor about three weeks later. He said, parents called me. He says, his whole demand, demeanor has changed, and he actually laughed for three days straight, which totally is uncharacteristic to him after he did that treatment. Uh, I had two chiropractors call me up. They said, we didn't believe you. And one of them said, I had a five-year-old child, autistic, I hadn't never talked, I hadn't never spoken a single word. I did your three-minute procedure on him. Turned his head and he said, thank you, doctor. He was four. Both of his parents were there. It's the first three words he ever spoke. They started crying. The chiropractor started crying. Another one called up. Had the same thing happen. A child who never spoken seven years old started speaking after he did this. 
the only chiropractor in the state of Texas who's on the recommended doctor list for treating autistic children because we can get the kids back in school with other kids by doing these things. Totally amazing. Stop elusive migraines, improve vision, hearing tinnitus, improve organ and gland dysfunction, crunch, uh, correct TMJ dysfunction. We get into all of that. Okay. Now, those first three correct the neurological system. Now, the nerves, nervous system controls the secretory and excretory events of the body. So one of the things you're going to notice as you go through part one, two, and three is people who you can get to respond with nutritional intervention, either by diet or supplements or whatever, they just start clearing up by themselves because it's actually a neurological issue and you didn't realize it. And you're going to start seeing when you start using these things that you need far less nutritional intervention than you ever needed because you're actually correcting neurological issues that's causing glandular and other dysfunction. And uh, you'll, you'll be totally amazed by it. And the patients will be too, because now they don't have to take all those pills that they used to take, okay? Now, part four, therefore, is pure body chemistry issues. So we have biochemical individuality strategies. Now, I have an MS in biology emphasizing new nutrition. I'm a master herbologist. I'm also a master acupuncturist. I've been a member of six nutritional, medical, and scientific boards of major nutrition companies. So I've helped form, formulate formulas uh, that thousands of people buy, probably millions, between all of them. I perform over 15,000 nutritional assessments. Now, my approach is different. Um, I show you the nutrients. And one of the things I do is I say, okay, here are the foods where the nutrients are abundant. At the end of each one, I say, do you now think that people aren't getting these through normal nutrition unless they're eating totally junk food? And everybody just goes, no, not at all. They have to be getting it. Therefore, it becomes a problem of because it's being put in, is it being digested right? Is it being absorbed right? Is it being transported through the blood vascular system right? Is it being absorbed into the cell? Is it being absorbed through the nuclear and mitochondrial uh, membrane? Then is it being broken down properly? And then is it being secreted or excreted? Then we teach you about the negative feedback loop, okay? So we want to see how that want you to see how this chemical breakdown occurs. Now the whole body operates on a negative feedback loop. So one of the things that I use here is, you know, for an example, if somebody has a problem with their electrolytes, we're usually taught to give them electrolytes. Okay, well, that's, that's just kind of passioned over. And I'm not, not saying that's entirely wrong because you may have to do that to help them for a while. But what controls electrolytes? Androgens. What controls androgens? Progesterone, which also controls cortisol, which then controls pain and swelling. What controls progesterone, though? Pregnenolone. Pregnenolone also controls DHEA. What controls pregnenolone? Well, pregnenolone is controlled by vitamin D and sunlight and cholesterol. Also, by negative feedback loop, the amount of estrogen that's in the body. Now, DHEA and progesterone control the amount of testosterone, which then controls estrogen. So you can take somebody, for example, with zero or low T, and a couple of steps forward or back from that, you can get them producing normal amounts of testosterone in a matter of maybe three or four weeks, okay, just by manipulating the diet and these other figures. So we teach that rather than necessarily intervening where the symptoms are occurring, you may have to intervene two or three steps before or after that because of the negative feedback loop. We get into all these so you really understand the biochemistry of everything that I just described, okay? So uh, we show you how to uh, strategies to significantly accelerate correction of I'm allergic to virtually every food, can't eat anything. I've taken pe people who uh, were in that and 
uh, literally taking uh, allergy shots for one, one person 28 and a half years, we got them off the allergy shots, okay? Uh, we got them to where uh, we showed them to where they only had problems with a few foods, but that was making them uh, uh, have reactions to all the other foods. And we show them how to identify those foods, okay? And it's a process. Autoimmune disorders, it really aren't. We show you the true mechanism of autoimmunity, which is different from what you learn. Dysmenorrhea, excess and prolonged flow of the menses. We show you how to get it to normal. We take people with heavy flows 10 or 12 days out of the month, get them down to three or four days, you know, light flow the way that it should be. Uh, bone mineralization, osteopenia, osteoporosis, fracture, how to correct those. Uh, over a period of time, infection. Uh, how do you take care of uh, whole body infections or local infections naturally? Hormonal imbalances, seizures, ulcers, bleeding ulcers, constant bloody noses, how to correct those, fungal and candida infections. We'll show you how to uh, correct candida two or three weeks maximum, okay? And uh, they don't have to have ongoing problems with it either. I mean, get off, get them off the drug. Chronic fatigue, all the things that helps cause that. Um, psycho psychometabolic, uh, met metabolosomatic uh, conditions, viscerosomatic, nutrient interdependencies, how one needs nutrient uh, relies on others, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, obesity, we show you a number of things that cause the obesity issue. Why it occurs. Uh, and 10% of adults, 90% uh, of adults over 40 have to lose weight, gain it again, okay? we we'll show you how to get off of that roulette. Yeah, Adkins fallacy, uh, you know, all this um, ketosis diet that you're seeing about, we we'll show you the dangers of doing that long-term. There are a lot of dangers. we we'll show you right out of the literature, it's actually, uh, studies that were done on uh, 130,000 people over 20 to 26 years. Uh, it's very long-term studies. Abnormal cell growth. Why do tumors occur? Why does cancer occur? We show you those things. Now to attenuate it in most cases, behavioral disorders, hyper and hypotension, bone demineralization, depression, hyper and hypothyroidism, hyper and hypoglycemia, Failure to digest, absorb, metabolize, secrete, and excrete. Okay, all that's on that fourth film in the fourth seminar. If you want to learn about those things, I suggest you get the film. Go to the seminars when they're available. And I also uh, do mentoring. Okay, here's some mentoring testimonials. If you want to improve your practice, improve your income, get your life back, that's what this is about. Now, here are some doctors already had great practices. However, Dr. Bonebreak's preeminence mentoring program is what I've been searching for my entire career. It combines top-notch unique clinical knowledge, procedures, down-to-earth business strategies that stand the test of time. Uh, this doc is up in uh, Minnesota, okay? Dr. B's mentor, mentoring program is second to none, wealth of knowledge, expertise shared, Maybe a much more thorough and streamlined doctor. He's from California. Mentorship program is the best investment I ever made. I thought I was a good doctor before meeting Dr. Bonebreak. I laugh and I think back the first time. And a triple money back guarantee. Who else does that? There is nobody else that does it. I know I can show you at the seminar what that triple money back guarantee says is, hey, if I can't show it to you in the literature and prove it, if I can't, you can't get the same results and I can't get a seminar predominantly, then I'll start putting your money back. Nobody does that. They wouldn't dare do that. And this doctor is in Cleveland. Since mentorship, I've seen several improvements in my practice, get see the payers, uh, patients get their desired results. He was in Chicago, improved his practice so much he upped his family, moved down to Florida. He was in Chicago. Now we're showing them how to 
start up his practice there and get going there, you know, just right out of the blocks. And he's a tremendous doctor. Uh, we showed him how to really up his practice. I wasn't sure if I needed mentors. I already thought my business was very successful. In a Dr. Bonebrake's seminar where I witnessed immediate changes. Myself, my brother observed other doctors as subjects of objective improvements. He's in Houston. Can't believe my practice, how my practice has changed and grown since I uh, began mentoring with Dr. Bonebrake, mostly sports chiropractic. Fort Worth, Texas. Been in practice for 23 years, own and operate successful chiropractic sports medicine in Austin. Mentoring program, no fluff, no cookie cutter, one size fits all approach. I don't try to make your practice like mine. I ask you, okay, what do you want your practice to be? And that's where we go. Everybody else says, okay, this is what I want your practice to be. I don't do that. Everybody has what they want to do, okay? We take you where you're at. We ask you where you want to go, and we show you how to get there, okay? Gilbert Danforth, you want to make global changes, fine-tune your skills practice, need Dr. Bonebrake. And he's in Lubbock, Texas. I've been a sole practitioner 25 years in my fair share, and then some of the seminars for four of consultants, techniques, and teachers. He got into mentoring. Okay, this guy is in uh, Houston area, okay? So we've got a lot of uh, successes out of this. Now, what does it take for the mentorship? I call it preeminence mentoring. And so what is this? Well, it works for everybody. Um, simply because we take you where you're at and where you want to go, okay? Everyone's a good fit. How does it work? Enables you to become top level. One of the biggest things out, you know, we talk about how to hire and fire help, how to run your office with the help, how to deal with associates, how to write contracts, um, uh, how to file insurance, how to uh, testify, how to write uh, narrative reports that are killer. Uh, you know, so you're in deposition, you're in court, we show you how to do that uh, to win the cases. Uh, we show you all that stuff. I have expertise in all of that. I'm also an accident reconstructionist. So that helps a lot. This enables you to become top level, rapid, efficient, patient response with scientific methodology found in medical literature, become a neurobiochemistry expert. Get referrals from everywhere. Remember, I've gotten, I've treated people from all 50 states and 97 countries. No reason you can't do that. I'm not the brightest guy in the block, on the block. Uh, ask my wife, she says, I don't have the brightest light in my brain. Anyway, get paid what you're worth, low stress and better family time. Uh, others, have changed their life. It's about time to change yours, isn't it? I, I think probably the only thing that separates maybe me from you uh, success-wise is I don't wait around. I decide to do something, I just go for it, okay? And a lot of you, you know, you wait, and wait, and wait, and say, oh, maybe this first, maybe this first. I decide I want something, and I just go for it. So like every class that I teach here, I just get my an idea in my mind and I say, okay, what do I want to talk about? And then I just jump into it and I study it and I bring it here. And I'm learning along with you in a lot of this stuff. Okay. But I just decide I need more expertise in this. And I know these people probably do also. Okay. And that's all you got to do. You just got to jump into it. Get paid what you're worth, low stress, better family time. Others committed and changed their lives. Now it's your turn. Now just Close your eyes and imagine business of your dreams, smooth running, plenty of highly satisfied and enthusiastic patients, as many as you want, whatever that number is. Financial security, time to enjoy with your family, time to exercise regularly, great health. Now, one of the things that I teach in this one-on-one, -on -one, for example, without even getting any more calls than you're getting. Now, here, here are the statistics. Out of every 10 calls that go into an office, on an average, seven or eight people who call in to inquire actually set an appointment, seven or eight out of the 10. 
then seven or eight out of those actually show up. So now out of 10 people are called in, only five actually show up. Out of those, only two or three actually follow through with your recommendations, okay? So now you're working with two or three out of the 10 that called in that actually follow through. Well, we show you how to talk on the phone when they call in to get nine or 10 out of 10 to show up or to set an appointment, nine or 10 out of 10 of those to show up, nine or 10 out of 10 of those to actually follow through. So it's getting no additional calls, which you're gonna get when you start doing these things. You've already tripled or quadrupled your practice with getting no more new patient calls than you're already getting. Then we show you how to multiply that three or four times, okay? By the methods that we're showing you. So we don't deal in fluff at all. We deal in grounded things, the work, okay? Now, you want financial security, time to enjoy your family, time to exercise regularly, and you want great health. Three reasons the mentoring works for you. It's because you will devote the time or the effort, time, and dedication to get what you want. I can tell you what to do, show you how I did it, show you how to do it, but you have to put the time and effort in. Charisma, obviously, is it necessary? Notice I misspell things in these productions all the time. I stammer. I have a lot of us and ahs. My wife says, I don't understand how you even give seminars because you're totally monotone. Uh, I am not David Singer. David Singer oozes charisma. Okay, I am just not it. You don't need to be either. You don't need that factor. You just need certain other things. Group one or one on or one on one mentoring is very affordable. Your next step: commit to be superlative. Go to the link ttapcenter.com, choose a mentoring level that fits you, and commit to change your life. Mentoring includes these: you got a 12 month group mentoring, one group call per week for 12 months at 52 of them, 500 a month, or one payment of $5,000, which saves you a thousand. And Everybody in the group interacts and everybody gets to ask questions. I give the answers. Everybody learns from the answers I give everybody else. You get to put in any aspect of your practice whatsoever, including taking care of patients. Okay. And so we want to up your income dramatically in accordance with your level of commitment, how to get paid what you do, get all those answers that you want. We want you to think and reason quickly in any practice situation. Give talks, it gets a lot of new patient. My average uh, patient talks that I give average 35 to 50 patients. Virtually all of them, every time, came in as new patients. Don't ask for patient referrals, get scabs of them. Communicate in a, such a way as to draw referrals from all over. I uh, will show you, you know, if you want to go to a mall, my average uh, mall when I give a mall presentation. I got 220 new patients average off of each one without advertising it, by the way. How to testify in court and depositions, write narrative reports, situations, answer that solve your own situations, how to best treat given conditions for the quickest results. I want you to be able to think quickly. I want you to have the answers right there so that anything speeds up what you do. Okay, I am here as a shortcut, purely a shortcut for everything that you're doing. And that, that is what I do for you, both in treating patients and getting your office working right. I've taken over a million half dollars worth of seminars. I've taken 32 cranial seminars, over 100 uh, vertebrae and pelvis seminars, uh, 37 extremity seminars. I am here to shorten your time and help you be efficient and superlative in every possible way that you can possibly be, okay? You gotta ask me the questions so that I can show them to you. Six month one-on-one -on -one mentoring, okay? By the way, in the group mentoring, uh, if you step up to the one-year one-on-one mentorship in the first three months, you get those benefits, which we're gonna show you. Now, next one is the six month one-on-one -on -one mentoring. You get a call per week, for six months, which is 26. So it's a thousand a month, the one payment of $4,000, save 
$2,000, pretty good savings. You get that one hour mentoring, talk about anything just like in uh, the group mentoring, only this time it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's directly related to you, it's just you and me one-on-one. -on -one. If you, and I wanna know what's at the top of your radar on any given time, because you know what's often in, in your office better than I do. And you say, okay, I'm having trouble here. And I say, okay, let's address that. Again, I'm not trying to conform you to what I think your practice should be, but we're here to solve the particular problems in your practice. So we go off of what you want answered at any given time. If you decide to step up to the one year mentorship in the first three months, you get all those benefits. The 12 month one-on-one -on -one mentorship, one call a week for 52 weeks. The thousand dollars a month or one payment of eight thousand dollars saves four thousand dollars. It also includes all four films. So you get all four for those films for a year. Also, we're going to be developing now, which I'm working on now, a link on your website. I have thousands of testimonials of doctors and patients. And we're going to have a link set up on your website to where you can uh, uh, patient or prospective patients can go through there and look at their condition on part one or part two or part three or part four and see what PTAPS has done for patients and what doctors say, hey, I, you know, I did this on this patient with this and this is what happened. So now it's not just you saying it, uh, it's the patient or pr prospective patient seeing that others have done it, thousands of them. And so now they get a different perspective. I did this on my own website and it got 20 totally new patients for each section, which is 80 new patients a month. And I told uh, existing patients to go on it. They went on it and they said, I didn't know you could take care of that. So 20 patients a month re-upped for new conditions that they didn't even know that I could take care of. So 160 essentially new patients every month just from putting this on my website. You get that free for a year uh, by doing the one year one-on-one -on -one mentoring. If you don't want to do the mentoring, uh, you can do each part $50 a month. Okay, you don't even have to do that to get into this when that's up. And well worth it. Doctor blogs. Now you get to interact with other doctors. Part one, part two, part three, part four. And in the one-on-one -on -one mentoring, uh, we're about to put that up, by the way, for the first time. You get to interact with doctors. Hey, I took care of this patient, and this is what I did using part one, part two, part three, part four. Uh, but I also did this. I found this work. So not only are you going to get what they use uh, in the TCAPs, but they're going to say also use this. So you're going to learn other stuff other than TCAPs by interacting with these other doctors. So you have a problem patient and you say, oh, I need help with this, okay? So other doctors will give their suggestions and you know, if somebody wants me to answer it, I'll, I'll put my two cents in and say, oh, this is what I would do, okay? And so that's well worth it. You get that free with the one-on-one -on -one mentorship or $50 a month for each part. You can get that and it's gonna be well worth it. So, any aspect of your practice, how to treat any patient issue, how to communicate is at least as important as patient treatment. I show you how to be very brief and to the point. I am not worthy at all when it comes to dealing with any of these issues. I show you how to get right to it. Uh, I average 640 new patient calls every single month for a year or for years. And when 911 came about, most practices dropped by 30 to 50%. Mine went up 1,700% and stayed there using the stuff that I mentor in and using the techniques taught in these TTAPS parts. It's efficiency and effectiveness, okay? You can have all that if you want. You also get 12 seminars online or in person. So you get 12 seminars as well as the four videos as well as the links, as well as the blogs. And like I said, I'm gonna see about putting those online. So you can either get them in person or you can do the online thing. You, you have 12 of those uh, with the one year. And we cover what's at the top of your radar first. 
to get a, a certificate uh, for completion of each TTAPS parts. And if you decide to extend for another year, it's just half the price. So if you want to up it after the year, which most everybody does who've taken the full year because it benefited so much, just $4,000, half the price, 4000 a month uh, for six months out of that. So basically, you need to commit. You've committed to your practice. How about committing to your dream practice now? Now, business results depend on effort and following directions. I can show you what to do. I can tell you what to do. I can tell you why. You're the one that has to take and make the effort. You got to lose excuses, take consistent action to improve. You'll do this. Sign up. You don't. Please don't. You know, it's going to be worthless to you if you don't go and do it. I give you the information and encouragement. You take action to improve your life, and this will improve your life dramatically. Okay. Now, before we sign off for the day, uh, I need to know if anybody has any questions on anything. We're about eight minutes over. Sorry about that. Do you have any questions whatsoever? Uh, just ask it over in the chat box before we sign off for the day. Any questions whatsoever? Ask it in the chat box. We'll stay on for about 30 seconds if anybody has any questions. Right here, if you want to contact me, there's the email, there's the phone number. So please feel free to do so. I want to help you with your patients. Okay. Do not hesitate at all. I've had a lot of docs, uh, you know, just go on from watching these and call me up about patients. That's fine. I want to help. Need links for videos uh, if you charge me. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've already uh, got all those to you, I think, Eric. Uh, but uh, we'll talk afterwards. Just give me a call and we'll see if you've gotten all the links. Okay. All righty. Okay. Thank you so much. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to have another good talk. And thank you so much. You have